All right, so hello everyone. And um, that's the time for us to begin the webinar. So firstly, I'd like to say thank you all for joining uh, in today's for HQTS's new on-demand webinar series. Uh, my name's Andrew Berry and I'm gonna be your host. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the sourcing of home appliances from China and how they assure, how can you ensure that they are of quality and compliant in today's market. Now, we have some fantastic guests today who are experts in the field to discuss that. But before the introductions, I just want to um, give a brief mention of our sponsor today, which is HQTS. Now, HQTS is a premium quality control organization with over 25 years of experience in the industry. Now, they cover a wide array of services, including inspections, testing, and helping throughout the entire supply chain process, a one-stop shop to help with your supply chain needs. As well as this, they work in a range of industries, including home appliances, um, gas, uh, it goes on and on. <laughs> so without, without further ado, to help us understand this topic, I'd like to, we're joined with some experts, as I said previously, in home appliances. Our first guest for today is Ulus Ozkan, uh, a general manager at Vestal. Now, he has over 24 years of experience in both procurement and strategic store sourcing. Now, we are extremely excited to have him here today. And firstly, I'd like to say thank you so much for joining us, Ulus. And I would love for you to introduce yourself and your background, if that's all right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm based in China, so greetings from China. I've been with Vestel for uh, 24 years. We are a manufacturer and a retailer. So we're doing both uh, component material side sourcing and also uh, product sourcing um, out of Asia and mainly going towards the European markets and, and Turkey. I'll talk a bit more about that. So thank you. Wonderful, that's awesome. Well, thank you very much for being here and I'm really excited to hear about your insight into the industry. So absolutely brilliant. Now, our second guest for today is uh, HQ, HQTS's very own Sam Khan. Uh, Sam has been a member of HQTS for over four years, providing his knowledge in of the electronics industry to assist many organizations in developing a, a streamlined quality control and supply chain framework. Now, again, Sam, thank you so much for joining us here today. If you could, much like Ulus, I would love for you to give a quick introduction and uh, more about your background and what you're going to be speaking about today. Mister, thank you for the introduction, um, Andrew. <clears throat> um, so. Of course, this is Sam. I've been working with HQTS for the past four years in our Fuzhou headquarters, um, mainly dealing with consumer goods, uh, specifically the electronic uh, kind. Um, we uh, are a third party company, uh, so we mainly focus on the quality and supply chain issues that our customers reach out to us for. Um, hopefully we can delve into this topic more today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That's wonderful. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing your insight on quality control and how it can really assist organizations um, around the world and globally. So before we move into the presentations themselves, I just want to give a, a quick comment. We will be having a Q&A session after each of the presentations at the end of this session. Now, if you have any questions, please go into the bottom right and put your questions throughout the presentation uh, and we will be sure to try and answer them at the end. So just to let you know that that's available. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna pass you over to our first speaker for today, Ulus, who's gonna be discussing the wider electronics market. So thank you, Ulus. Thank you, just give me a second here when I put it up. No problem. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, firstly, let me talk about, you know, walk you through what I'll be talking about today. Firstly, I'll start with an introduction of uh, what I do and what we do um, at Vestel, just to give you a brief idea of my background. And then we'll go over to a market overview, um, which will cover you know, overall home appliances market uh, globally, and then move on to 2022, which has been a turbulent year. I'm sure all of our guests are aware of the 
strategic events that are happening, geopolitical events that are happening around the world. And then I'll talk a bit about China home appliance exports, what China is exporting uh, to the world and how that's changed uh, over the past year. And we'll talk a bit about sourcing strategies. This is more, you know, some daily tips from my own experience, from my own failures, let's say. And then um, I'll talk a little bit on the approach to quality, but I think Sam is going to be covering uh, a lot deeper on that area. So again, I'm working for Vestel. Vestel is a Turkish company. Uh, we are a manufacturer. It's actually the largest industrial facility in the whole of Europe under one uh, location. So we do consumer electronics, which are mainly TVs. Uh, we also cover uh, home appliances. Uh, we would like to say MDAs, major domestic appliances. Um, and we are the leading producer in Turkey and uh, within the top 10 uh, in the European market. We're mainly geared towards the EMA region. So Europe is the largest market. So all of our product development, quality requirements, uh, testing, and you know supplier sourcing, and all that value chain is geared towards uh, a very strict compliance towards the European markets. Um, and then we do both ODM and as a multi-brand owner, we also do our own retailing. Uh, we have 1,200 stores throughout Turkey. And in Europe, we are running a, a variety of uh, brands which start with Sharp, which is licensed to uh, Vestel. So we're running that Japanese brand. And then we own a number of other brands, regional brands. So um, that's an overview of uh, Vestel. So we have overall, we make uh, four, uh, 30 million devices a year, uh, 18,000 employees and $4 billion uh, turnover. So then what we do in uh, Asia, basically our headquarters in Shenzhen, I'm, I'm based here as well. And then we have offices in, in Shanghai, in Taiwan and recently in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Because with the trade war starting, Vietnam has been a rather popular destination. We see many manufacturing moving over there, especially for the US market. It is quite useful due to tax savings and uh, so on. So um, basically, so what we do is we have the component side, material side, which are all sourced from here throughout Asia and all go to our factory uh, to be used in our production in the final assembly. Uh, but then there are so many products that we don't manufacture and we are actually sourcing them from China. This could be under MDA categories, some products like cooling products, uh, laundry products, and also SDA categories, all those coffee makers, uh, beverage preparation, food preparation, motor driven, and floor care also is a big category. So we're using our brands and we are working with our partners here in China and the products are shipped directly to the end markets, all the way from Turkey to UK, Germany, France. So we ship directly to our uh, retailer customers or distributors uh, throughout the continent. And uh, so this is an overview of the market because I think home appliances along with the telecom uh, and IT has been majorly affected by the pandemic um, with the staying home in 2020 and partly in 2021, people tended to you know, eat at home and spend more time at home, uh, work at home. So we saw an amazing growth in most of the categories. But I think the, the start of the pandemic was the cooling products because you need more storage to store your, uh, your, your groceries or your frozen foods and be prepared for what may be uh, even worse than the current situation. So even in uh, last year in 2021, we see that the, the, the domestic appliances, major appliances have grown about 12%. This is global excluding North America. So this is JFK report. This is $900 billion basically a retail value for this entire electrical products category. So it's good to see which categories have slowed down, which are still going strong. So uh, small appliances, domestic appliances, and major appliances are still going uh, strong along with the um, IT products. And this one is interesting because this compares 2019, which was pre-pandemic, and 2021, which was you know, almost in the 
recovery stage, especially the second half. And we see that still quite strong and healthy growth in uh, major appliances and, and domestic appliances. Uh, we in Turkey as Vestel, we have seen it's been a very difficult year in the sense that the production has been uh, fully booked. So our lead times have increased last year throughout last year, uh, all the way to multiple months, uh, over 90 days in some, some categories, even more. Uh, because we also see that during the pandemic, it's been kind of a wake up call where everybody was chasing the best price, you know, cheapest price, and then putting the orders into a single location. But I think with the pandemic, uh, also with the trade wars, that uh, the, all of us in the world have learned that it's very important to diversify. It's important to look at localization. So uh, companies like Vestel ourselves, we have actually benefited from that because of all the difficulties of forecasting so many months into the future, uh, it's much easier to source from a nearby location to you. So I think this would be um, a good way to look at your sourcing strategies in the future. So it's not always about the price. It's not always about having the best supplier that you're used to working with. It's good to think about how to um, balance your portfolio, so to speak. Um, again, looking into different regions, um, Western and Eastern Europe, they both grew 7 and 13% respectively uh, last year. China has shown the biggest growth. Actually, the rule of thumb last year was that the countries that suffered in 2020 mostly, which was China, especially in the first half, have shown a stronger recovery uh, in the second half. So uh, again, Europe has done uh, well uh, into uh, end of um, last year. So now 2022 is a turbulent year. Um, there are so many factors that we can talk about. I'd like to touch as much as I can briefly on uh, several topics of importance here. So of course, in 2021, uh, talking about all these uh, disruptions in the market and all these uh, supply chain problems, uh, material problems in the market, everyone tended to place orders earlier, kind of pulling all that demand forward a little bit. So it was expected that 2022, especially the first quarter, uh, we're going to see a certain weakness in demand, which is actually uh, have been happening uh, this year, earlier this year. And um, the other factor is the materials, because we have started this year with uh, increasing material costs continuing to increase. Uh, and oil is having a major impact. And it's spreading over to the plastics, which are very important uh, for all your home appliances, uh, PP, ABS, uh, polystyrens. They've shown growth throughout uh, the last year and continuing that uh, situation. Uh, lithium, which is very critical for uh, batteries, basically increased uh, five folds uh, last year. And, you know, in home appliances trend uh, being Mobile mobility and uh, cordless applications are popular. So this battery cost increases are putting a lot of pressure. Uh, this is of course coming because of the growth in the uh, car market, electrical vehicles, but also on the uh, supply chain disruptions of the metals uh, itself. Again, a similar thing could be said for steel and uh, aluminum and, and copper. Uh, the other important point, the key point is the cost of shipment. I'm sure everyone who's involved in sourcing or distributing products are aware of this, uh, that they're still continuing to um, increase and be in tight situation this year. So if you think about uh, the bulk here, the appliance that you're shipping, because some products maybe you only can put uh, less than 100 pieces in one container. So talking about it, $2,000 container price going up to $10,000, that creates a significant uh, cost factor that uh, could not be ignored at all. So uh, at this moment, uh, this situation is seemingly not going to get better uh, this year, especially with the recent developments, uh, the lockdown in, in Shanghai. Now, train was a good option last year, and we saw that out of China, almost 
half of the northern European, Germany, Poland, that area, and the Baltic area, the shipments going towards there from China, almost half of them have been shipped into the train freights, train shipments, which were um, comparably faster. And with the sea freights increasing, the cost delta has been kind of close. And there were certain government support programs to a large manufacturers in China last year, so which made it a very viable option. And uh, many people have taken advantage of that. However, unfortunately, this year with the situation of Russia, Ukraine, earlier in Kazakhstan, uh, train is kind of disrupted and people are not looking at it as a good option uh, at this moment. So everyone is basically counting on the sea freights and trying to secure space uh, uh, using the uh, ocean freight. So normally um, we would have had with the demand decreasing a better year for uh, shipment, better year for containers, uh, booking containers. But this latest situation in Shanghai, you see that the red line here is showing the number of cargo ships waiting to load or discharge at the Shanghai port. It's actually at precedented levels. I mean, comparing to 2020, 2021, it's uh, more than two, three times uh, worse. So that means because every time uh, that such kind of disruption happens, uh, whether in US or whether in China, it takes one quarter to recover from that. So we can expect that this situation, this disruption that's happening right now in Shanghai is going to go continue until uh, end of July so that some recovery can happen because it's basically affecting availability of containers and sh uh, cargo ships throughout the world because we have to look at it end to end uh, process. Um, finally, just want to touch base on the currencies. Um, uh, Chinese RMB is going to get slightly weaker uh, as the year goes on. These are the expectations from HSBC, which were just published this week. So expectation is to have about 6.55 by the uh, end of this year. Uh, nothing major, nothing significant. And Euro is expected to slightly lose uh, value against the US dollar. Um, so this is Chinese exports, basically products that are shipped out of China uh, globally. It's good to see what's happening under different categories here. So in 2021, basically overall, if you look at the red line here on the left, 20% uh, growth value-based, dollar-based, and 8% growth on the uh, quantity base. So very strong year across the categories. And you can see that the strongest was refrigerator, as I said earlier, basically the categories of laundry and coolers due to the uh, stay home policies around the world have benefited these uh, areas. But another interesting thing to see is uh, the quantity based growth is 8%, but value based growth is 20% uh, over uh, almost 2.5 times of that. And one of the reasons is the uh, price increases that people have suffered last year. Another one is that um, people have moved on to more higher value products uh, importing out of China instead of very commodity and very basic products because you have to factor in the total cost arrival uh, into your wherever your market is. Uh, that makes it even more difficult for importing appliances out of uh, China. So similar thing could be said for the kitchen appliances, but however, the, um, the both value and quantity have grown about 30, 35%. Uh, so uh, very strong year last year. However, this year we see, as I said, uh, weakness in demand um, in uh, entire across all these categories uh, because of the end markets. Um, but overall in Europe, another special situation is the war in uh, Ukraine because that's basically putting a big pressure on all of the European economies, increasing gas prices, energy costs, this is going to impact the demand in a great way. Uh, not naming any brands here, but we know that a lot of major uh, brands actually uh, have reduced their sales forecasts in the European market in the double digit number. So this is definitely gonna have an impact uh, on the demand and also coming back to uh, China. So uh, to sum it up, this year is slightly weaker uh, we might expect two to three percent growth uh, overall, 
uh, and Europe especially challenging due to uh, the energy costs. And I expect that the, the shipping costs uh, to stay strong and expensive throughout the 2022. The one thing to note here important is seeing all these uh, supply shortages and uh, supply chain disruptions. Um, I expect that some of this uh, holiday season demand is going to be pulled forward because if you talk about uh, you know, Black Friday, uh, normally you could ship out of China around August or even early September, mostly in August, but people are gonna be placing those orders, I think much earlier, maybe even starting from May. So we'll probably see a Q3, which is busier. That means uh, May, June, July period busier. And August, September, October, um, our forecast is going to be relatively uh, quiet. So looking at sourcing strategies, these are just practical team, uh, tips for those of you who are uh, new in this uh, or uh, trying to increase your business uh, in the Chinese market. Uh, it's very important to know the partner that you're choosing, the supplier that you're choosing. Are they a manufacturer? Are they a trading company? If they're a manufacturer, is it really their specialty what you're trying to buy from them? Because people tend to offer a wide range of product, but it's important for us to know, actually, are they really specialized in that product? Are they able to deal with all various kinds of issues that could happen during production or with their own supply chain of materials? Um, so that you won't have any headaches and make sure that you get multiple offers from various regions of China or different sizes of uh, manufacturers and if possible from different regions, not only China. And another thing that people tend to in the rush of getting things done earlier is having a proper paper trail. That means purchase orders, uh, contracts, even if it's just one page contract, you don't have to make a 50 page contract. Even if it's a one page contract that summarizes everything that the other party is going to deliver from you so that the deliverables are critically listed and everything is clear. So in case anything happens, um, worse come to worst, you need to ask support from your consulate, from a lawyer, because the first thing people will ask you later on is that you show them the paper trail. Everything is in place. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to pursue that and you'll be wasting good resources, money, and most importantly, your valuable time. And one other thing to mention here is that don't risk safety and make sure all the compliance um, um, has been uh, taken care of. That could be CE or other uh, safety uh, certifications, test reports. If you cannot do it on your own, uh, some people have uh, people on board uh, in China on land, but then companies, uh, third parties can help you to take care of that. And if you're not um, heavily invested on the quality side, on the testing side, at least have a good ramp up plan. That means start with a small order just to try how it works commercially, technically, supply chain and everything, and then be ready to place bigger orders, maybe holiday orders or other promotional uh, orders. So again, just not focus on a uh, price. That's in procurement, a, a mistake that all of us have made. I know I've made in the past uh, many, many times uh, a good price. Lacking a good value, good price is always the target. That's because customer is the king and the customers are pushing the sourcing uh, professionals to always look for bargains. But then we have to look at the overall picture because uh, you can lock in a good price, but you have to deliver it on time you have to make sure you can deliver the quality uh, that you have committed in the uh, beginning. So always look at the uh, whole picture. Now, this is an example of our quality life cycle from Vestal. So we start with the you know, first contact with the supplier, doing the supplier audit, looking at the certain risks, and then starting the test, uh, the product test, reliability test, safety test, looking at all the certification and compliance, and then we move on to the green part, which is production. If it's a big order, critical order, we are there doing production ourselves or our third party partners. And then we do a, a pre-shipment uh, inspection. And then it goes all the way into the field because if you are committed to do the after sales in your market, uh, don't forget that for the next two years, you're responsible for anything that might happen. So it's important to know to come back to the beginning 
to make sure that the partner you choose in China is going to respond to you two years from now if you have a problem, if you need spare parts, or if you have some epidemic issues that need to be resolved. So it always comes back to uh, looking at the whole cycle. And finally, the finish line, if you are successful with a high quality level and customers are satisfied. So this is all for me up to now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ulas, for that. Um, I think that was an ex exceedingly excite insightful uh, presentation. I think everyone here learned a lot. I think it's really interesting to see how each of the different kind of struggles that's going on in, as you said, the political sphere right now in both China and Russia is having such a knock-on effect across the world in terms of the supply chain. I found that exceedingly interesting, as well as that, just even uh, the practical tips that you had as well. I think just having something that's so actionable that I think personally, a lot of people would say, oh, well, I think of that, but really putting it something so simple in that way makes it, well, actually it is really important for them to think about that because you're right. Uh, things like a paper trail is so essential to making sure that you're compliant and nothing bad happens. <laughs> well, if something bad does happen, you're uh, prepared for it, I guess is the, <laughs> the best thing to say. Yeah, so that was absolutely fantastic. Um, one thing I want, I want to pass over to you, Sam, actually, and just get your thoughts on that presentation, if that's all right. I think there was a lot, I think there was a lot of overlap there about quality and the tips. So it'd be great to get your kind of opinion on that. And we'll, we'll yeah, create definitely. So, um, I just like to begin by saying that was wonderful. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Thank you very much, Alas. Um, I'm actually familiar with Vestal. Uh, so obviously that, that, that played into it. Um, but uh, I think I want to go back to what Ulas mentioned towards the end, um, some points, uh, for example, the tips, uh, know who you work with, paper trail, don't risk safety and compliance, and the ramp up plan. Uh, I think so many uh, of our clients, at least, uh, they, uh, they fail to consider all of these points. If they're ever aware of one or two of them, they're not aware of all of them. Uh, and of course, this plays uh, greatly into, into the final product that they receive. Uh, oftentimes, when we receive uh, uh, inquiries from our clients, uh, we can always source them back to these kind of issues. Uh, so that was definitely uh, informative. Yeah, great. Oh, what, one quick question for you, Les, actually, as well, um, just saying guest. Uh, do you still think it's a good time to source from China, or, or should we, do you think, organizations should move that shift into countries like Vietnam and potentially even Thailand. Um, I know that was something that you mentioned in the presentation, so it's really interesting to get your insight on that. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of hype about Vietnam uh, right now. Um, we as Vestel have uh, opened up an office there in Ho Chi Minh City uh, last year. Uh, there's a lot of potential, definitely. Um, on the other hand, of course, China has such a rich ecosystem, so strong, uh, that uh, even people go into Vietnam and set up shop, they still move all the raw materials and semi-raw materials, electronics from China into the countries like uh, Vietnam. So mostly just doing the plastic injections and the uh, final product assembly. Of course, the, 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 uh, uh, the, our friend that is asking the question, it also depends on the market that you're, you're gearing at. For example, if you're in the US market, and there's a 15% tax for the product you're sourcing. If you have an option to get it from Vietnam, by all means, that's going to give you a lot of savings. But for Europe, for example, for home appliances, the tax impact is minimal. So if you're, it doesn't make too much difference whether you're sourcing your appliance out of China or out of Vietnam. But if you have, because I'm also considering the shipment cost, but if you have a chance that you can source it from closer to home, uh, Turkey, for example, then that's going to save a lot of time. That's going to save a lot of um, uh, shipment cost as well. So always look into the uh, arrival cost. But overall, yes, it's a good option to look into uh, Vietnam. At least things like lockdowns, for example, Shanghai has been closed now for almost 30 days. So if you had a supplier there, then you would get nothing out of them. And or your suppliers in other regions could not source raw materials to open up. You know, one news is that Tesla's factory just opened yesterday or day before, but then they don't have the parts to produce with because the supply chain has been disrupted. So it's always good to have the options. 
Yeah, that, that's a brilliant answer. Thank you so much, Ulas. I think, yeah, definitely. It'll be interesting to see in the future how organizations pivot and move to these new locations and how they develop as well in the future. So very interesting. Thank you. So just looking at the time, uh, we're going to move swiftly on to Sam. So I'm going to thank you very much, Ulas, for that. And Sam, I'm going to pass the mic over to yourself uh, to go for your presentation about uh, quality and its importance. So thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, uh, both you and Alas. Um, just quickly share. Mm. Bear with me one moment, please. Too many windows open. <laughs> it's, the, it's the classic. Uh... <laughs> no, wonderful. And just, I'll take a quick moment as well to say, uh, remember to, if you have any questions from either of the presentations, just to add it to the Q&A section at the bottom, which we will answer at the end of this presentation. So thank you very much. And I'll pass you over, Sam. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, so sourcing home appliance from China and ensuring quality and compliance. Um, really thankful for Ulas for covering so many points earlier on. Um, I think some of the points may, may uh, overlap uh, but hopefully we can delve into that after uh, afterwards in the Q and A. Um, let's go. Uh, so quality control, quality assurance in the home appliance and electronics uh, and electrical items industry. Um, home appliance are relative, uh, sorry, relatively complex products. Uh, they involve machinery, materials, and electronic parts. Um, if the production enterprise lacks knowledge. Uh, and the technology and the QC discipline or ability, uh, the product is obviously prone uh, to various defects, uh, such as fire hazards or electrical shocks, uh, chemical risks, etc. cetera. Um, according to the relevant watchdogs in the EU, um, in 2021, the unqualified rate of batches of domestic kitchen and bathroom electrical products was just over 19%, at 19.1%. Uh, the defect, uh, sorry, the defective and dangerous products um, reported by the EU will account for 20, sorry, do account for 20%, uh, 10%, sorry, <laughs> I think I'll go slower, for 10% of electronic appliances um, in 2021, so just the past year. Uh, in addition, home appliances are products with high contact and use frequency. Uh, so consumers usually do not have the professional know-how, the ability to identify uh, defective or hazardous products, uh, unless, of course, uh, they're burned by them or shot by them, uh, which we don't want, which nobody wants. Uh, in order to minimize the risk and prevent harm to people, it's particularly important to prevent and control product quality and safety, uh, obviously through inspection and testing. This does not uh, explicitly have to be through third parties. This can be in-house or wherever. Uh, but yes, uh, inspection testing is, is a compulsory uh, requirement uh, for product safety and uh, compliance. Um, this is obviously also in direct correlation to customer complaints, disputes, and organizations' uh, corporate reputation. Um, it can also deter problems such as order discrepancies for importers and exporters and regulations and market compliance. <clears throat> so why is quality control uh, so crucial to your supply chain management? Um, in today's age of cutthroat market competition, uh, companies are using innovative ways to raise their product quality standards. Uh, they aim to gain a unique place in the customer's minds. Uh, modern day firms believe in and follow a customer centric approach. So customer is always right or the customer's demands are always number one. If the customer uh, does not like the quality standards, brands will fail to make an impact in their minds. Uh, and obviously, if you run a business, adapting a quality control approach to your supply chain management is, uh, is necessary. Uh, so some of the... Uh, some of the points I'd like to discuss are locating defects and scrap, uh, a quality control approach or system uh, will benefit in this way. Uh, so locating defects and scrap, etc. Uh, in case of defects in the raw materials, quality problems uh, will surface in the end product, uh, which can make the whole production, uh, sorry, the whole procedure or the whole production, uh, that lot or that batch inefficient uh, and increase uh, defect rates. Uh, also particularly important to your bottom line if you don't want to uh, waste materials or time or, or 
almost finished products, uh, but they can't be released due to quality defects, uh, major quality defects or critical quality defects. Um, the second point is reducing the variabilities in your materials. Um, materials purchased from the same source may not always be the same. Um, variability is obviously part of the process and it's impossible to get these exact same materials every single time. Um, machines wear out and obviously require work and this can also affect the, the materials that you're receiving on your end. Even if you struggle to ensure um, ensure consistency in the quality of material sourced, uh, you can still identify inconsistencies with a QC program. Uh, so obviously it's not a fail safe uh, sort of uh, program, uh, but it helps to identify uh, where the issues uh, occur. Um, external failures, this is also another benefit of QC in the supply chain management. Uh, if there's a mediocre uh, supply chain system, uh, you probably will not get the desired uh, uh, quality of products. Uh, as we last mentioned earlier with the triangle, the time, quality, and um, sorry, the last one is off the top of my head right now. Uh, but just as we last mentioned earlier, um, if, if the quality control in the supply chain uh, management system is, is not up to par, uh, then you'll be receiving uh, subpar products. Um, they're likely to obviously get damaged in the uh, in the uh, transportation phase or maybe in the handling phase, uh, but wherever it is, uh, a quality control approach uh, employing or retaining a certain quality control or quality assurance systems uh, and putting them in place across your supply chain uh, will reduce the uh, the chances of these occurrences happening. So back to that one. Uh, so you as a uh, importer or you as a manufacturer or you as an end user, why would you care? Um, electronic uh, quality control is an integral part, uh, sorry, integral, integral part of the uh, production process. Uh, this top level priority obviously dictates the quality of factory output. So that's very important for the, for the manufacturers. Uh, quality control matters uh, largely because it determines the it determines, sorry, uh, it determines the, the uh, sorry, I'm at a loss for words again. Um, it, it determines the operating costs. Um, so companies want to know how uh, it determines the operational lifespan of your product, sorry. Um, if companies want to know how long their products will remain, if companies want to know how long their products will remain functional uh, to the end user, uh, maybe in the future they want to offer some sort of warranty uh, or, or come up with a warranty uh, time frame for their products um, this is uh, this is uh, quality control is essential in that sort of uh, calculating phase um, the warranty period is often uh, calculated based on based on the uh, quality of a product uh, it can be very costly if the product fails before it's expected to uh, so uh, many uh, complaints from your end users, from your clients, uh, maybe product recalls and et cetera, and nobody wants that. Uh, of course, after sales is, is absolutely necessary, and there is a certain uh, percentage of clients who will come back to you uh, in regards to quality issues or maybe uh, issues of other natures, uh, but um, in regards to the actual warranty period, uh, manufacturers should be on top of that. Uh, they should uh, at least have a minimum sort of uh, operational lifespan for their products and a quality control system uh, can determine this, this lifespan. Um, it also prevents costly product failures. Um, I'm sure everybody over here remembers the Samsung fiasco, the Samsung Galaxy Note 7 uh, and its uh, exploding batteries and the significant loss in consumer trust and the brand reputation emphasize the need for improved quality control methods in the company. Uh, Samsung is still uh, paying for that. Um, uh, I, I have to be careful with my words, but Samsung is still paying for that financially, at least uh, up until today. Um, it's mandatory according to most government regulations and most regions. Uh, so industries like medical and automotive, uh, they're probably more severe in their, and more stringent in their requirements uh, for quality control. Um, but this can also be uh, 
this can also be said about the electronics and home appliance industry, uh, since, uh, again, at the beginning, when we've mentioned, this is a high contact and use frequency sort of uh, product range. Um, uh, for the sake of both uh, manufacturers, uh, the, the uh, brand, uh, sorry, the organization or the brand and your client safety, uh, it's probably a good idea to not skimp on QC during the manufacturing process. Uh, so benefits of employing quality control in your manufacturing program. Uh, customers expect and demand high quality products. Uh, when customers receive quality products, uh, you reduce the liability risk, you improve safety as a manufacturer, as a brand, sorry, as a brand, uh, you maintain or improve your position in the market, most likely, uh, contribute to overall positive branding of your product, gain repeat business, increase customer loyalty, et cetera, et cetera. Um, furthermore, manufacturers with QC procedures in place are far less likely uh, to, uh, to face product recalls or, or place customers at risk from poorly made uh, products. Uh, and the costs associated with these recalls can be steep, uh, sometimes numbering into the six to nine uh, figure recall costs. Um, there was a company just recently, I think last year, uh, the estimated recall cost, I can't remember the exact company off the top of my head, but the estimated recall cost, I think, was six to nine uh, billion uh, in US dollars. Uh, so it's definitely um, uh, necessary. Um, so the, how to ensure product safety and market compliance. Uh, obviously, there's steps we can take uh, as maybe uh, importers, uh, as end users, and as manufacturers. Uh, I'll try to cover the three aspects over here are mainly related to importers and manufacturers, but later, uh, later down the line, we'll also uh, uh, expand more onto the end user side of things. Uh, so there are three main aspects to the acceptance of products as being safe in any particular market. Um, product safety legislation, is number one, uh, product, uh, product standards, sorry, and the type test related to product standards. Uh, the first of which, uh, product safety legislation, uh, is a legal obligation of the manufacturer or supplier uh, not to supply a product which could damage or uh, injure its end user. Uh, particularly in the UK, uh, these, are embodied, sorry, these are embodied in the low voltage directive, for example. Uh, the regulations uh, enforced vary across the region. So in the EU as a whole, uh, there are other directives and regulations, uh, and the end user obviously has to look out for them. The importer has to make sure the imported products are in compliance with these regulations, and the manufacturer uh, has to receive, uh, sorry, has to uh, prove that their products uh, obviously are in compliance with these regulations and standards and tests uh, too. Um, product standards, uh, since legislators obviously can't uh, dictate the, uh, the impossible task of detailing the design requirements for every single product on the market, uh, that's absurd, of course. Uh, so a wide range of standards have been developed to support these directives. Uh, these standards uh, enforce, um, for example, in the U EU, uh, the CE mark, um, and these standards are the second aspect of product safety and compliance. Uh, new standards are developed under the control of Senelec. Uh, so if you are interested in keeping up to date uh, with standards in your regions, uh, please do follow up over there. Um, the third one is a type test uh, derived from these product standards. Uh, this third one, th these are laid out with the intention of providing a format for type testing. Uh, for type testing appliances to which the, sorry, uh, a format for type testing for the appliances uh, to which uh, uh, manufacturers can design their products uh, and they can base the designs of their products on these type tests. Uh, but the main use for these, uh, for this third range, uh, these uh, standards, sorry, these type tests uh, is for a, ben uh, sorry, a benchmark for third parties uh, to basically assess uh, in a comprehensive manner uh, an affair manner uh, and show to, to either the manufacturer who retains this third party or the importer who requires these documents uh, to show at the uh, borders uh, or the end user if they want to uh, source a relatively safe and hazard-free uh, product.
Um, in the UK, in the UK, uh, the BSI kite and the BAB approval mark are probably uh, some of the more familiar ones. In the EU, it's the CE mark, and in the US, it's the UL mark. There are ob obviously many other standards. Uh, some of them are absolutely necessary, and some of them are just suggested requirements. Uh, due research is obviously, uh, sorry, research is obviously due uh, by the end user and importers. Uh, moving into um, the product recalls and the data uh, for 2021 uh, and for March of 2022. Uh, so the uh, annual 2021 and the March 2022 uh, data. Uh, in March 2022, uh, in the uh, European Union, uh, according to the Safety Gate uh, annual report, uh, sorry, the report issued in March, uh, the most product recalls uh, most products uh, corresponded to four categories, uh, as you can see on the right over here, if I can just quickly zoom in. I think that's about as far uh, zoomed in I can go. I do apologize. Uh, so there are four main categories, um, motor vehicles, toys, and jewelry, and the last of which being electrical appliances and equipment at 23 instances of recalls uh, in just the month of March in 2022. Uh, most of the recalled products are also from mainland China. So 112 instances only from mainland China in March. Um, reported through the EU via the Safety Gate um, 2021 annual report, uh, 2,091 notifications on consumer products posing health and safety risks were documented in 2021 across the year. Uh, the main risks... Uh, I can just zoom to the right. The main risks uh, were injuries, chemical risk, choking, and electric shock. Uh, so most of which you see across the, the electric and home appliance uh, product range. Um, in regards to the US, uh, most of this presentation is centered around the UK and the EU, uh, but let's just delve into some of the data uh, in regards to the US. Uh, according to the CPSC, um, the most um, the U.S. Uh, in March 2022, the U.S. recalled 21 products in 10 categories. Uh, the most recalled products uh, corresponded to four categories again, um, electrical appliance being number one at four uh, issues, four instances of recalls in just the month of March. Um, topping the list uh, for, uh, for most major issues sorry, topping the list for most of the issues uh, is uh, product could cause injury uh, at 26.5%, a risk of fire at 25.6% of products, uh, the reason is for the product recalls, and product could cause burns, either fire or chemical related, um, at 15.1%. So how do we avoid these issues? Um, uh, as mentioned earlier, I'd like to break this down uh, in three different uh, forms. So one of them is obviously related to the end users. I'm not sure if you have too many customers uh, uh, joining us today, uh, too many clients, sorry, or maybe, uh, uh, of course, everyone over here is an end user uh, of other companies' products, maybe not particularly uh, the ones in discussion today. Uh, but uh, the end users is number one, importers and manufacturers. Uh, so how to avoid these issues? Number one, for the end users, what's most important is to register your product. Um, many household products, especially electrical ones, uh, such as home appliances, come with the option to register them with the manufacturer. Uh, you can do this on the manufacturer's website. Uh, this can also activate an extended warranty or guarantee, uh, but obviously mostly advised for safety reasons. Um, registering your product also means you can be directly informed by the supplier, the manufacturer. Uh, or maybe even uh, some, uh, some uh, other governing bodies uh, that there is a safety issue with your product. And if you need to get any repairs done, um, or if the product is recalled or a refund, uh, sorry, if a product is recalled, um, then obviously the manufacturer can also issue a refund or replace the product. Um, you can also register secondhand products. Uh, so not a lot of uh, people know this, but yes, secondhand products can also be registered if they're within uh, the warranty period, I think. Uh, number two is for the importers. Uh, what's most important is obviously verify uh, compliance with your destination, uh, destination, destination market uh, regulations. 
Um, for example, in Europe, when importing from non-EU countries, importers must check the products fulfill all EU safety, health and environmental protection requirements before placing them on the market. Uh, the importer has to particularly verify that the manufacturer outside the EU has taken the necessary, sorry, the necessary steps to allow the product to be placed on the EU market. Uh, the necessary documentation, such as the EU declaration of conformity, which is absolutely required uh, for all importing activities, uh, and the technical documentation is available on request uh, by the border uh, representatives or governing bodies. Uh, contact with the manufacturer is also possible at any time. Uh, this is also a requirement. Um, for the manufacturer, um, obviously there are many, many different uh, routes we can take with this one. Uh, but today I'd like to particularly focus on, please do ignore the graphic on top, uh, mentioning third party vendor. Uh, it's just an innate instinct I have from being a salesperson over here uh, in the past. Uh, I'm always trying to sell our services, uh, but for manufacturers, um, quality control in electronic manufacturing is obviously a particularly important aspect of the assembly line, and it can protect against compliance and safety issues. Uh, usually your quality assurance plan must include the following critical processes uh, labeled over here. So risk management certified engineers uh, must be hired in-house, uh, certifications must be uh, achieved uh, either for the uh, manufacturing facility or for your personnel. Uh, this is just a suggestion. This is not an absolute requirement. And then the first article approval is usually uh, a technique used uh, to, to minimize uh, most uh, quality defects for mass production phases. Uh, so the first article approval is before mass production, of course, and then standardized inspection. Um, both, uh, obviously the standardized inspection um, it's not an absolute requirement, uh, but uh, weighing the the cost effectiveness to uh, sorry the cost effectiveness ratio in in the uh, overall picture in the larger picture most of the time the cost is uh, is worthwhile uh, the cost associated with the inspection of course if it's out, uh, if it's outsourced uh, obviously most factories have their own in house QC too. Uh, both small and large businesses often find it helpful relying on third party for some of these um, critical uh, requirements. Um, it doesn't matter if it's long term or short term, uh, most quality uh, quality centered or supply chain management centered uh, third parties, uh, they can provide the technical expertise and know how uh, to deal with these uh, quality specific issues in your supply chain. Um, okay, uh, so I'd like to end this presentation on a case study. Um, it's it's particularly intriguing even more right now since uh, we, we received a uh, a question earlier on from from one of our viewers. Uh, uh, I think in regards to whether the Vietnamese market is worth uh, uh, moving from from China, where you're uh, established and you're stabilized, and moving your supply chain to the Vietnamese market, or maybe expanding into the uh, Vietnam market. Uh, this client X, uh, client X uh, was uh, doing exactly that last year. Um, so so <clears throat> the services they procured from HQTS are supply chain management. It's a wide range of services that cover, uh, for example, the SQE service, supply quality engineer. Um, where we provide our in-house quality engineers or tooling engineers, process engineers, test engineers uh, to our clients wherever they need be, uh, mostly across Greater Asia. Um, this particular client, uh, they, they obviously have a mature and established uh, supply chain in mainland China, uh, but due to the COVID, uh, COVID situation, they wanted to expand into the Vietnamese market, uh, maybe a freer market than here. I'm not too familiar with the reasoning um, so uh, from the headquarters, they received this initiative uh, and obviously the, the uh, person in charge over here uh, had to somehow enact this plan. And they got in touch with HQTS and after a few rounds of consultation, uh, finally we came up with, we came up with many a uh, uh, project proposal. Uh, but in the end, uh, we decided to provide our NPD projects sort of uh, service plan. Uh, which includes the SQE service, uh, quality engineers to the uh, 
uh, new Vietnamese factories in Vietnam, where the client, uh, the client from the mainland China quality base, uh, quality and supply chain office, or their headquarters in the US, uh, they could not travel to the Vietnam location, of course. Um, so, so we have local uh, engineers, etc., in the Vietnam region, and we assign them to the client's factory, and we dealt with uh, most issues that come across, but mainly the NPD project. Um, and in the end, uh, the results that we achieved, sorry, uh, I know this has been very uh, confusing, uh, I've been going back and forth, but let's just move on to the results. Uh, the results were the client's flagship product uh, reached mass production phase in due time. So that was one of the main goals for this NPD project. Um, new manufacturing facility uh, was optimized to optimum efficiency, at least uh, in the time frame that we received. Uh, we hit the client's targets and their requirements. Product quality and regulatory compliance upheld with the support of our technical team. Uh, with, uh, most third parties, not only HQTS, most third parties, uh, when you're retaining their services, it's not just the uh, it's not just the manpower that you receive. You also receive the technical expertise and the knowledge of the whole enterprise. Uh, so, so that's something also to consider for manufacturers. A client why? Um, the next case study, Client Y. Client Y, um, maybe in the last few years, there's been a resurgence of sort of a sustainability, uh, if, at least for major uh, brands and organizations. Um, so, so, so HKTS has also uh, obviously posted some of our ESG services. Uh, we've also previously provided them in the past, but we've uh, put extra effort in the last two years. Um, the service this client particularly uh, was interested in is also ESG, uh, and the project that we proceeded with was also an ESG sort of oriented uh, project. Uh, their products are mainly electric fans, AC units, kitchen utensils, etc. The issue was corporate initiative uh, from their corporate headquarters uh, in Europe, I think it was, because Europe obviously uh, more so than America or some other regions uh, place particular importance on the ESG initiative. Um, uh, okay, uh, that's a, uh, sorry, that's a, uh, that should be EU, not US, I do apologize. Uh, so the ESG requirements uh, and ESG requirements came from the US, uh, from the EU headquarters, uh, particularly the energy expenditure, expenditure across this client supply chain, uh, which included, I think, 150 plus uh, suppliers uh, in mainland China, in Vietnam, Malaysia, um, Thailand and a few of the regions. Uh, so the solution that we provided was initial energy audits, level one, sorry, level two and onwards. Um, client already had the basic data for the ESG report uh, with the level one audits. Um, following consultation uh, uh, included plan of action and we, uh, sorry, encompassing energy expended and waste across both manufacturing process and the facilities. Uh, so it was not only um, as you'd usually expect from, from quality control oriented third parties, it was not only just the manufacturing process, but also the uh, factories, facilities, uh, energy uh, waste uh, was brought down. So the result is an overall 30% decrease in the initial, I think it was roughly a four month project. Uh, so in roughly four months, there was a 30% energy waste reduction. Uh, that's from the beginning, from the audit, right up until the plan of action was engaged. Uh, so 30% energy waste reduction achieved. Uh, the ESG report was obviously bolstered by the data that we collected during our audit phase two. Um, I'd like to end the presentation right over there, and I'd be more than happy to uh, move on to the Q&A session. Thank you, well, very, thank much. you very much, Sam. Uh, yeah. I think it was and obviously a fantastic quote. There. I think it was really interesting uh, what you'd said regarding quality and its importance as well, especially I think there was a lot of, uh, I did like how you both interjected with your points, especially about the, it's more important about the quality and that's what consumers need more so than something that's just cheap and fast. So it, it's great to see that there's alignment across the industry, across that uh, of, of quality products. Um, being first so yeah that's fantastic thank you so much so just conscious of the time so thank you very much Sam I'm just going to move over into the Q&A session now our first question is from uh, Bernard and this is to you Lewis 
And what he asked was, um, do you see a significant trend for increasing quality in production slash assembly processes at CN factories with fully automated lines uh, compared to more traditional assembly lines? Okay, so this is about China factories uh, moving towards fully automated assembly lines and whether that increases the uh, quality. Well, actually what fully automated factory does is that it makes sure it makes sure that within the same batch of products um, there's unity, so you don't have big variations on workmanship or, or labor or other uh, assembly problems. So that assures that. But still, the overall quality improvement depends on two things: depends on the product design, because if you have a not good design, the automated line is just going to produce that perfectly. Okay. And the second one is the material use. So if you, you know, the product is as, as good as it's designed and the materials that put inside, well, of course, the automation helps take care of a lot of small mistakes that uh, you don't want to have. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's really the question. Yeah. Yeah, I think the answer to that absolutely fantastically. I, th I think it's really interesting saying that, you know, regardless of automated lines, it comes down to how the, how the actual design and how the, the thought process is before products made. And that is always yeah. going to be the same. And that, that's yeah. the core fundamental of all products, I guess you could say. So it's interesting to see that there's still kind of a holistic traditional aspect to it, even though organizations will most likely move to more automated processes and lines. So yeah, absolutely brilliant. And our second question was to yourself, Sam, and what the question was, was discussing about smart home trends and how they can turn safety. So product safety is so important, as you said, and with home appliances and a move to, you know, kind of more trendy uh, smart home, is there any major things that you've seen in your experience that have come up in terms of potential dangers or how organizations are kind of moving forward to ensure the safety of these products. Um, so, um, I think I understand that question. Um, so the market of smart appliances uh, and smart devices are obviously expanding. Um, the range of products, last I had just five years ago, I think a smart device was a, was a doorbell hooked up to your computer. Um, but this is slowly moving into the household now. Uh, I think we have smart uh, fridges, uh, smart TVs, obviously, the, one of the first ones, uh, smart microwaves, ice makers, wherever it is, you have everything. Uh, you just name it, you have a smart device for it. Um, the use of smart devices and internet of things is obviously growing throughout the household too. Uh, so so, so it's, it, there's more than just a basic quality control sort of uh, requirement right now. I think in the future, it's more of a, it's more safety, not only in the uh, product quality uh, aspect, it's also safety in the information aspect for end users at least. Um, but the best thing I can say right now, uh, the best piece of advice I can give at least is identifying and following the appropriate standards as early as possible in the design phase, uh, which can basically simplify decision-making and shorten your time to market. Uh, in regards to manufacturers' uh, point of view, I do hope that answers the question. Maybe in a yeah, roundabout way, I can I can add something to that, Andrew, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes, because that's an area that we are also as Vestel uh, investing a lot and uh, expanding our product range. Uh, one good example is these little robot vacuum cleaners uh, that are everywhere around the world. You see them becoming a household thing as a second uh, vacuum cleaner. So one thing to um, um, pay attention to is the, the, the security, the data security, because uh, places like Europe, they have very stringent laws and regulations, and the responsibility here falls upon the brand owner or the importer that you need to make sure that where the data is stored, it should be in Europe, and you need to, you're responsible basically for the usage and the security of that data, and that's a very big responsibility and uh, it's amplified by the amount of products that you sell in the market. So now, Sam, I haven't seen any third-party services saying that we can make sure of that and improve that. Maybe that's a product that you could offer to the market because it's a very technical area. 
So okay. appliance is one thing, and then this is IoT sitting on top of that. And that's a very uh, important uh, part of the uh, safety issue as well. Yeah. Definitely so. Um, privacy policies, uh, obviously for the end user, again, sorry, privacy issues, privacy policies, uh, obviously must be checked up by, by the end user in regards to each and every manufacturer. Most manufacturers have their own uh, issues in, uh, sorry, policies in regards to these uh, privacy issues. Uh, so again, um, this, uh, this again, uh, as you've just mentioned, Ulas, presents an opportunity for a third party uh, to come in and, and provide uh, these kind of services. Uh, to not only the manufacturer or importers, but maybe also to end users in the future. Um, but yes, uh, HQTS is definitely expanding into the Internet of Things uh, realm. Uh, hopefully in the coming year, we can come back to this discussion. I think, I think you'd all be more than welcome to join for another webinar at that time. <laughs> hopefully so. so just conscious of the time, and sadly, that is all we have time for today. Um, so I would like just like to firstly thank both of you, both Sam and Ulas, so much for uh, coming and taking part and giving their kind of expert opinions on these topics today. So again, thank you both very, very much for your time. Um, one thing I would like to make out as well, and thanks again to HQTS as well for hosting the event. Um, what they like to ask if you have any concerns about quality control or any questions about the webinar itself, um, you're more than welcome to reach out at any at inquiry at hqts.com in which you can ask for the recording and as well as that um, get a free consultation for your quality control needs. So once again I would like to thank all of you so much for joining and we would love to see you again. So thank you so much and thank you again to Ulas and Sam. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you everybody. Sam. Goodbye. Hey, thank you. Thank you. All right.